The late afternoon sun shone bright, casting shadows against the mountain backdrop that was just behind us. It was the same mountain that Jesus, just the day before, took Peter, James, and John to, leaving the rest of us disciples behind. You know, as disciples, we have been with Jesus for a little over two years now, and we have seen and experienced some amazing things. I mean, we've seen this man do things that we never even thought possible. He's casted out demons. He's healed sick people. He even fed over 5,000 people with just a couple fish and some loaves of bread. I mean, surely, based upon what we've seen and we've experienced, surely this man is the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for, the Son of God. And it was there as we waited for Jesus to return that a a man brought his only son to us to be healed. Apparently, this, this boy, had his son, had been struggling with the demon that he had in him ever since he was a child, and this demon would often throw him into... Uh, fits of convulsions, throwing him to the ground where his whole body would become rigid and he would foam at the mouth and gnash his teeth. And his father said that the demon robbed him of speech. He couldn't talk. And that often this demon would would throw him into the fire and water and attempts to kill him. So he brought him to us to have him cast out this demon. And, you know, Jesus, we've been with him. Not only have we seen and we experienced his miracles, but he's even given us the power and authority to do some of the same things he's done. We too have been preaching the good news and, and healing the sick and then casting out demons through his power. So we did what we've been doing and, and we prayed, and, but it, it wasn't working. We did what we, we were taught to do, we, but the demon still was there. And, you know, we We've seen, some, we've seen Jesus do some crazy things, and, and we've done things we never thought possible through his power, but it just wasn't working, and we didn't understand why. And soon before we knew it, a crowd began to gather, and, and religious leaders were there, and they started to argue with us, and we were at our wits, and we didn't know what to do. And it was just then, as we lifted our eyes beyond the crowd, we saw Jesus descending the mountain and coming towards us. And a, re- a wave of relief rushed over us because we knew surely he would know what to do. And as he approached us in the crowd, it was in that moment that we learned a lesson in faith that we never expected. And it is here where we begin our story this morning. If you have your Bibles or your iPhones, your smartphones, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 9 and put a marker in Matthew 17. We'll be in both places this morning. Um, You have notes in your note sheet. The scripture should be on the screen so you can follow along that way. So while you're getting yourself all situated, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. For those of you who I have yet to meet, my name is Amber, and I'm one of the pastors here at Lifeline, and I get the the privilege of being able to serve alongside an awesome dream team. You guys are amazing, and it is nothing but a privilege to serve alongside you. And so for those of you who have been with us for the last few weeks, we've been doing this series titled Frequently Asked Questions. How many of you have been here for our series? It's been awesome, right? And we've been tackling some questions that um, may be common questions for you who are new in your relationship with Jesus, but I also think that it's been a good one for those of you who, like me, have been following Jesus for a long time to have some of the same questions, but we're just too, you know, maybe prideful to admit it because we think we should know the answers to some of these questions by now. So I think this series has been good for all of us. And Anna, this morning I want to answer the question which I think can relate to both those of you who may have yet to be a follower of Jesus. You may be just kind of sticking your toes wet in this church thing, or maybe you have been following Jesus for a long time. And that is, how do we deal with doubt? So this morning I want to talk about a few things. The first thing I want to talk about is is expose a common misconception that we have about doubt. And then from there, I want to talk about how um, doubt can actually be used to strengthen our faith. And then I want to talk about how it's not important just having faith, but what we do with it matters as well. And then I also want to conclude by sharing some action steps that we can take from moving from a place of doubt or maybe even unbelief to putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive in. Sound good? All right. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is living and that it is active, and it has the ability to pierce our hearts and expose truth. Lord, and your word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing your word. So as we hear your word this morning, I ask that you would birth uh, a new measure of faith in our hearts this morning, whether it be for the first time 
or just diving deeper this morning and that above all else that as we do, your name would be glorified in this place because it is you alone that is worthy. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm going to start off reading in the book of Mark, chapter 9. This story is actually in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but um, Mark and Luke's versions are very similar, so I'm just we're just going to bypass Luke and read Mark. But I want to read um, both of the stories back to back because I know Pastor Elliot's talked about before how these are eyewitness testimonies. So a little bit of the details may be different, not because they contradict each other, but because they complement each other. So I want to read them both so we get a clear, holistic picture of the story. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, starting in Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 9, starting in verse 14. It says, When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some of the teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening, Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of the child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that spirit? Jesus replied, this kind, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Then if you want to flip over to Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. It says, At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, You faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. Afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So the first thing I want to talk about is let's expose a common misconception that we have about doubt. We all, whether we are followers of Jesus or not, have times where we struggle with doubt. To have feelings of doubt means that you're human. You have a flesh, a fleshly body. So it's not a matter of whether you struggle with doubt, but rather how you handle it. Because you see, the problem is that whether we claim to believe in God or not, we can easily fall victim into believing the lie that having doubt about God is the same thing as not believing in him. We equate feelings of doubt with being unbelief. For the believer, this could be thoughts of, well, I'm a bad Christian if I have any struggle with doubt, or I'm having some kind of crisis of faith if, if I'm having feelings of doubt, or maybe For the unbeliever this morning, this could seem like, 
well, you know, I have doubt and I have to resolve any feelings of doubt before I can come to Jesus. But both are simply not true because doubt is not the absence of faith or the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. A pastor by the name of Colin Smith is quoted by saying, doubt is not the absence of faith. Doubt is the questioning of faith. You can only doubt what you already believe in. You can have faith all the while still struggling with feelings of doubt. And I wish I had time to go into more examples this morning, but just to th throw a few out there um, in the Bible, Abraham's a great example. He had faith in God. God promised him that he was going to give him a descendant and that his descendants were going to become a nation. But that promise was a long time coming. And it, the Bible says that, God, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But one of the times we read in Genesis where um, God reaffirmed that promise to Abraham, Abraham says, but God, how will I know? He believed God, but he was wrestling with feelings of doubt. David is another perfect example. Anybody ever read the book of Psalms? Okay. <laughs> Homie, heck a struggle with doubt. Okay. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't sound any more doubtful than that. God had gave him a promise as a young boy that he was going to be king, but it wasn't looking like it was happening. And he too had feelings of doubt. But a lot of times when you read in the Psalms, he's crying out to God, but he tends to always end it by saying, but you are still good. You know, why are you downcast? Oh, my soul, put your trust in God. He had faith in God, even though he was struggling with doubt. Another good example is Mary, the mother of our Lord. When the angel came to her and said that you will be with child, what does she say? Uh, <laughs> how's that going to happen? Because last time I checked, I was a virgin. And when the angel told her, no, this baby is going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit, I doubt she really knew what that meant. I mean, how many years ago? We don't really quite understand sure what that means, right? But we believe that it's true. And what was her response? I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. All three had faith but still had moments of doubt. You can have faith but still struggle with doubt. So I have a really silly analogy. Bear with me. And it's kind of simple, but I think that's kind of telling because... I think a lot of times we tend to uh, make this stuff harder than it, when it needs to be, okay? I was really wanted to build some kind of contraption that looked really janky, that would hold myself up, but looked really janky, but I didn't know what to build, and with my luck, I'd build something and fall flat on my face. And for those of you who heard our airport story, my mom and I have already done that, so <laughs> don't really want to fall on my face again. But let's pretend for the moment that this chair is super jankier than it already is. I mean, it's a folding chair, right? And I'm doubting its ability to hold my weight. It's plastic. Folding chairs aren't really reliable sometimes. I don't know if they've ever broken on you. They've broken on me before. It's old. It's kind of squeaky, kind of wobbly. I'm doubtful that it'll hold my weight. But you know what? I'm going to put my faith, my trust in the chair even though I'm kind of a little worried, oh, but look, my faith superseded my doubt. I wasn't completely convinced that it would hold me, but I let my faith be bigger than my feelings of doubt. I still had feelings of doubt, but I still had faith. Unbelief, because remember, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is. Unbelief says, I ain't sitting in nothing. Are you kidding me? It's not the same. I may have doubt that this chair is strong enough to hold my weight, but can still act in faith that it will by choosing to step out on faith and sit on it. I can have doubt in the chair's strength all the while making my faith or my belief supersede my doubt. So let's look again in Mark 9 at Jesus' response to the Father. Starting in verse 23, it says, when, you know, when the Father asks you know, if you can, Jesus says, what do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. So it wouldn't be a time of me talking to you if I didn't give you some Greek words, because I love my Greek words, as you know. So the, so as we know, the, the 
New Testament was written in Greek. So this Greek word here for belief is derived from the word pistis, meaning faith. And it means to be persuaded or persuasion. Faith is always a gift from God. This is the definition. This isn't my thoughts, okay? This is in the concordance, okay? So good. So belief, faith, persuasion. This is what it means. So faith is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. In short, faith for the believer is God's divine persuasion and therefore distinct from human belief or confidence yet involving it. The Lord continuously births faith in a yielded believer so that they can know what his preferred will is. So again, remember that the opposite of faith is not doubt. It's unbelief. And so uh, if if doubt or, excuse me, if faith means persuasion, to have unbelief just simply means you have yet to be persuaded. So as I was thinking about this definition of faith or belief, meaning to be persuaded, God's divine persuasion, it kind of made me think of uh, a jury in a courtroom. How many of you ever served on a jury before? Yes. I got really close. And I'm one of those nerds that gets really excited when I get a jury summons. Like, yes. Uh, so I was in this, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three years. I, um, I love everything about the criminal justice system. I'm such a nerd. But um, I was in this jury selection once. It was a really, really high-profile case in Lodi. Um, and it was five days of jury selection. I mean, we, we had to fill out this lengthy questionnaire about what you believe about this and that. Because, you know, the, the lawyers, they want the most unbiased person towards their side as possible. So we had to fill out this questionnaire. And then we're pulled one-on-one into the jury box to be asked questions by both the prosecution and the defense. And if it doesn't get any more intimidating than that, we get pulled individually into the judge's chambers to be questioned by the judge with both lawyers and the bailiff. And it was like, I'm on TV right now. I feel like I'm in an episode of Law and Order or something. It was so crazy. But but, so, I mean, the, the... The lawyers, they do their best, right, to pick the most non-biased person that they can. But we're human, right? And no matter how unbiased you claim to be, you still have somewhat of a bias towards things. Say, you know, did the dude kill the girl? There's a part of you that's either on the fence on one side or another, no matter how unbiased you tend to be, right? But uh, in civil cases, I sue you, right? The, The... decision is based on a preponderance of evidence, but in criminal cases, you know, the people versus Amber, anybody know what is the determining factor? Beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So you can have a bias towards, "Mm, he's kind of guilty, but I'm not completely persuaded beyond a reasonable doubt. You're needing the prosecution or the defense to prove their case, to persuade you one way or another, right? And the thing about juries is that when you serve on a jury, you're agreeing, whether you realize it or not, to put yourself in a position to be convinced by one side or the other. Sounds kind of a lot like our faith definition, right? And whether we realize it or not, the Lord is continually trying to prove himself to us, to persuade us of who he is, who we are in him. Psalms 19, 1 through 4 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a word or sound. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God is continually trying to prove himself, to persuade us of his goodness, of who he is, of who we are in him, etc., in order to strengthen our faith. We just have to put our hearts in a position to receive it, to be persuaded like you do when you're in a courtroom as a jur- as serving as a jury. Because faith is not something that we can conjure up on our own. Faith is actually a gift from the Lord. Romans 12.3 says, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give, you each, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. So the NIV translation says, with the faith 
God has distributed to each of you. So let's look again back at Mark 9 in verse 23 at Jesus' response to the Father. He says, Jesus is not saying anything is possible if a person believes and does not have any feelings of doubt because the issue is not a doubting issue here. It's an unbelief issue. And some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, Amber. Doesn't the Bible talk about, you know, somewhere in James about not praying if you have doubt? Well, let's read. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So you're saying that I can have faith but still wrestle with doubt, but James just said that we can't ask if we have doubt. Let's go back to the chair analogy again, okay? I can, like I showed before, have feelings of doubt while still having faith, right? What James is talking here about a person who asks but has doubt is like this. I'm going to turn to the side so you can see a little better. God, I believe you. You are so good. I'm standing on your word, God. I'm standing on your word. You know, this situation, this whatever it is I need to see breakthrough, God, your word says that you are my healer, so I believe in you to be my healer. Looks real good, doesn't it? You guys might think I do squats every day, <laughs> which is a lie. But it looks real good, right? My back's all straight. I can sit here all day. I'm believing on the Lord, but I'm not sitting in the chair. I'm relying on my old strength, own strength to hold me up. It looks real good, doesn't it? But I'm missing out on the benefits of sitting in the chair. That's what James is talking about for a person who's praying but still having doubts because they're relying on their own strength. Heaven forbid I admit to myself that I have doubt because, you know, if you have doubt, you're a bad Christian. And I for sure am not going to tell my, the people in my small group because I'm afraid of what they may think of me. And I'm definitely not going to admit it to the Lord because who knows what he'll do, so I'm just going to continue to sit here doing all the right things, going through all the right motions, all along, not really having faith. You guys following me? Does that make sense? So it's okay to wrestle through feelings of doubt while walking in faith. You know what I find interesting about this story is that the father is the only one who admits that he has unbelief. But we know that both he and the disciples had unbelief because what was Jesus' response when he was told that the disciples were unable to do it? You faithless people, how long must I put up with you? How long am I going to be with you? So we know that both of them struggled with unbelief, but yet the Father was only the one to admit that he had unbelief. The disciples' focus was on their inability not in the fact that they had unbelief. And perhaps their disappointment of their inability to cast out the demon was because their dependence was on themselves and not of God. Just like my dependence was on myself and my ability to hold me up versus in resting in the chair and the benefits that comes with it. So again, it's not about having doubt that's the problem. It's how you deal with it that matters. Which leads me to my next point. Not only can we struggle with doubt, while still holding on to our faith. But secondly, doubt can be a driving force that helps strengthen our faith. <clears throat> in Mark 9 again, starting in verse 20, it says, So they brought him to Jesus, meaning the boy. And seeing Jesus, the spirit immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has this been with him? From childhood, he said, it often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. But if you can do anything, 
have compassion on us and help us. I think that the father's unbelief here is not in Jesus' ability to do anything to heal his son. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought him to Jesus and the disciples at all. Deep down, he knew that Jesus had the ability to. I think that he was struggling rather with Jesus' willingness to do so for him. His request was have mercy and compassion on us, not an inquiry of Christ's ability. And I think that this is where we tend to fall into the unbelief trap. We've been convinced that we serve a big God who is able to do big things. But where we struggle with doubt and unbelief is that he's willing to do it for me. We have yet to be convinced that he cares enough to do it for us. So let's look at Jesus' response. If you can, echo Jesus, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy cried, or the boy's father cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Or the NLT version says that help me to overcome my unbelief. Jesus does not rebuke the father for struggling with unbelief but rather works with the small kernel of faith that he has. Jesus doesn't say, come back when you've gotten your unbelief issue together, but rather he's saying, so you do believe, huh? I can work with that, no matter how small. The father's omission of doubt paved the way not only for a miracle to happen in his life and his son's life, but gave opportunity for faith to be birthed in his heart. Think of how differently this story would have been if the father didn't admit his unbelief. Now, this is just pure conjecture. This is just me thinking. Would his son have been healed if he never admitted? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But we do know that a few chapters over in Mark 6, when Jesus was in his hometown, the Bible says that he could not do any miracle. Because why? Why? because of their unbelief. So maybe the boy may have been healed, maybe not, but I don't know. Something interesting to think about. But what I do find interesting is that the disciples didn't admit their doubt until later. It says when they were alone in the house in private, they went to Jesus and asked, why couldn't we do it? You know, in a a situation, in a setting where it's less embarrassing, not in public, because it said that there was a large crowd gathered and a lot of religious leaders, they're arguing with them. And they wanted to save face, right? These are the disciples of Jesus, for crying out loud. They should have been able to do it, but they didn't admit it until they were alone with Jesus. And again, just conjecture on my part. I can't help but think that maybe in that moment, if they too, like the Father, would admit it, yeah, we were struggling with unbelief, Jesus, because, I mean, we've casted out demons before, but nothing like this if they maybe would have admitted in the moment their unbelief too, maybe they would have been able to be a part of the miracle because it wasn't the disciples that cast out the demon, it was Jesus that did it. I can't help but think that how many miracles have we possibly missed out on or ways that God could have used us but didn't because we were too afraid to admit, hmm, I'm wrestling with doubt or I have unbelief in my heart that I'm not convinced that you are this to me in whatever area it is. Doubt has the ability to deepen our faith. In James 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What does the testing of our faith mean? It means wrestling with doubt. But it also says that we got to allow it. It says the testing of our faith produces perseverance, but then it says allow perseverance to finish its work. If we give our doubt to God, he can use it to produce stronger faith, but we have to be intentional about letting it happen. So to the believer this morning, you need to know that doubt, if dealt with properly, forces you to seek God for answers to questions that you may have and allows him permission to confirm your faith in ways you never experienced before and as a result will actually strengthen your faith. 
for those of you maybe this morning who have yet to put your trust in the Lord, you're not quite convinced that he's good. You haven't surrendered your heart to him. You who think that you can't come to God while having any doubt, remember if you've been here and you've heard Pastor Elliot's story before, he said it several times that he prayed while sitting on the corner of that back box spring mattress, God, if you're real. Do you think that he was 100% convinced on God's existence? No, but he reached out anyways. And the rest is history, right? You need to know this morning that it's okay to come to God even though you may not be 100% sure of his existence or convinced of his existence. By coming to God, even while you're struggling with your feelings of doubt, it gives him the opportunity to prove himself real to you. So not only can we struggle with doubt while still holding on to our faith, and not only can doubt actually be a driving force that helps strengthen our faith, but thirdly, it's not just having faith that's important, but rather what we do with it that matters. So let's look at Matthew 17, if you still have your places there. Let's look at Matthew's account of the story. Starting in verse 19, it says, Afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. And I want to read out of the Amplified Version. It says, He answered, Because of your little faith or your lack of trust and confidence in the power of God. For I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if you have living faith, the size of a, mus size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So I know in Mark's version it said, um, this demon can only, or this kind can only be casted out through prayer. And we're in this version, it's saying, because the littleness of your faith. Again, the gospel accounts don't contradict each other. They complement. So both reasons are true. When we, um, some, some translations say through prayer and fasting, or we read it just said prayer. It's both because prayer and fasting put yourself again in the dependence of God. I can't do this on my own. I need you, Right. We're trusting in the chair and not in our own ability. But then also, secondary reason is because your faith is too small. But then he goes on to say, but if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, then you can move a mountain. Well, which one is it? Is it that it's too small? Or if I have a small faith, it will move a mountain. It seems like he's contradicting himself here, but he's not. So again, Greek word for you. I'm not going to try to pronounce this one because it's hard. But the, the definition for little faith that Jesus is saying here is because you have little faith. Again, this is the definition. This is not my words. It's so good. Describes someone dull to hearing the Lord's voice or disinterested in walking intimately with him. Jesus is not talking about a quanti the quantity of their faith being too small, but rather the quality of their faith. It's not the amount, but rather the condition of their faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and reward those who earnestly seek him. You can have faith, but if you don't exercise it, it's meaningless. Uh, there's a pastor by the name of Tony Evans. Anybody familiar with Pastor Tony Evans? Yes, my dad listens to him all the time. He actually preached a message on this very um, same story, and he's quoted by saying, when talking about the mustard seed, the seed itself is tiny, but the life inside it is big. Planting it acts of, activates the life inside of it. I can have a seed filled with life-giving potential, but if I don't utilize its ability, it's worthless. And I have with me, I was going to get mustard seeds, but we had sunflower seeds at home. So why go buy mustard seeds that I'm never going to use if we have sunflower seeds? Can you open that for me, please? <laughs> it's already open. And that way, too. I mean, they're tiny, but you can kind of see it better. Thank you. So it's not the size that matters, right? 
but the life inside of it. This seed is filled with life-giving potential, but if I don't plant it, it doesn't activate that life. And I'm not much of a green thumb person. A green thumb person. How many of you are plant people? A couple of you. I have a hard time keeping succulents alive. I've discovered which is really sad. But what I do know, what I do know, is that if I don't plant this seed, after a while, what happens? It becomes dormant. And if left dormant, after a while, when you do try and plant it, it won't germinate. And what happens to seeds that don't germinate? They die. Doubt, if not surrendered to Jesus for him to use to strengthen our faith, will produce unbelief. An unbelief, if left to grow, will limit the power of God in your life. There is no neutral ground when it comes to doubt. It is not static or unmoving. It's either pushing us towards faith or pushing us towards unbelief. There is no middle ground. So the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is that if you and I are not seeing the power of God at work in your life, the power of God at work in the ways that we read about in the Bible, then perhaps there's some areas of unbelief in our hearts. And maybe it's not necessarily in God's ability to perform, but in his willingness to do so. We have yet to be convinced that he cares enough about you and me to move on our behalf. But you need to know this morning that whether or not you struggle with feelings of doubt, God is big enough to handle your and my feelings of doubt. And maybe as I was talking, you're realizing, wow, I don't just have doubt, but there's some areas of unbelief, areas where I have yet to be persuaded that God is who he says he is in my heart. Even though I'm saved, even though I'm going to heaven, you need to know this morning that God is big enough to handle your unbelief as well. So let's talk about some action steps that we can take based upon all of this, whether you're wrestling with doubt or unbelief or both, how we can move from that place to putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. And they're all A's, just kind of happen that way, so maybe I'll help you remember. But the first one is admit. Admit your unbelief and or doubt. Those of you who are in recovery at all know what's the first step of getting help? Admitting that you have a problem. Same thing. We got to admit that we struggle with doubt or we have to admit that we have unbelief in our hearts. The father recognized what was standing in the way of his miracle. Do not allow Satan to keep you trapped in shame and not wanting to admit that you have feelings of doubt or that you're struggling with unbelief because of the way many people may think of you. Like the Father, choose to be more concerned with the severity of the problem than you are and how, and how your unbelief may hinder in God moving in your life versus what people may think. Don't be like the disciples who didn't admit. Be like the Father because growing in faith, it begins with humility. Number two, ask God to help you overcome. Because it's one thing to acknowledge that you have a problem, it's another thing to ask God to help you with it. Which seems really, really simple, but again, I think we tend to overcomplicate some of these things. Especially the longer you're in church, you make it a lot more spiritual than what it is. What did the Father do in our story? He, number one, he admitted that he had unbelief, and then he asked God to help him to overcome his unbelief. And it doesn't take anything really more than that. The Father prayed a one-sentence prayer, help me to overcome my unbelief. But it was big enough to give Jesus permission in that moment to move in his life. Third thing is act on the faith that you have, no matter how seemingly small, even while you still may have doubts. Remember the chair analogy. Let your faith surpass your doubt by declaring God's truth and promises even before you feel it. So an example may be for whatever area in your life that you may be wrestling with doubt or unbelief, maybe it's finances, maybe you're battling a sickness, whatever the case may be, 
Google scriptures of God's word that apply to that area of your life. God, folks, we are so blessed to have technology at our fingertips. All it takes, I do it all the time. Okay, Google, pull up scriptures about you fill in the blank. Boom, Siri, Google, whatever you have. We'll give you a fat list. Make your list. Write them on index cards and then pray something simple like this. God, your word says this, blank. You fill it in for whatever area it may be. God, your word says blank. I don't feel it. I don't fully believe it. But I'm accepting it as truth regardless of my doubt. And I give you permission to convince and persuade me that that's true. It's as simple as that. So at this moment, I want to go ahead and invite the worship team to come on up. And I want to give us all just a time to respond to the Lord in whatever area it may be. Maybe you are wrestling with feelings of doubt in your life because of your circumstances. Or maybe as we were talking, you realize that, wow, it's deeper than that. There's some unbelief in my heart that I need to resolve before the Lord. And while I definitely believe that the Lord wants to minister on um, whatever area that might be for you, I asked him um, this week, what specifically, Lord, do you want to speak to today? And, and I felt like he was saying the area of dreams and callings. Some of you here have God given dreams and things that you know God has called you to do but you have yet to see the manifest in your life. And the enemy would love nothing more than to have your doubt become a breeding ground for unbelief in your heart and as a result, destroy your destiny. But you need to know that God is strengthening your, your faith. He's growing the life inside of your seed because it's not big enough yet for the harvest that he wants you to have. Don't get discouraged this morning that you're not seeing the fruit of it. He's growing the life inside your seed because he has a harvest in mind that exceeds your expectations this morning. So I'll go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to speak to two groups of people this morning. And not because bowing your heads or closing your eyes is anything more spiritual than keeping your eyes open, but we want to give privacy this morning. There's no one looking around. If you have yet to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you've been one of those ones that I was talking to is you've had doubt about the Lord. Maybe because of life circumstances, you've yet to have been convinced that he is good and that he exists. Today is your day. Don't feel like you have to resolve any doubt before coming to the Lord. It's as simple as like Pastor Elliot prayed, God, if you're real, get me out of this. So if the Lord is tugging on your heart this morning, he is trying to convince you that he is who he says he is, and you want to surrender your heart to Jesus for the first time this morning, go ahead and raise your hand. Amen. And maybe you have been following Jesus for quite some time, but you're in a season of your life where you just don't know what's going on. You, you you know that God is good, that he's in control, but you are really wrestling with doubt right now. Or maybe it stems and goes even deeper that you're realizing in this moment that, wow, I have some an unbelief issue that's standing in the way of me receiving everything that God has for me. I want to give opportunity for you to respond too to the Lord as well. So if that's you this morning, whether it's doubt or unbelief or both, that you're wanting to acknowledge and surrender to the Lord, go ahead and just raise your hand. Father, I thank you for the work that you're doing in each and every person's heart. Lord, I thank you that you've given them the courage to acknowledge it. Lord, and the courage to give it to you. And we're asking this morning that you would take our doubts, take our unbelief, Lord, and that you would do just like the Father did, help us to overcome our unbelief. We surrender it to you this morning and ask that as we surrender our doubts, our questions are not knowing, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would use the season that we're in in our lives, our feelings of doubt, 
and that as we surrender them to you, that you would strengthen our faith, that we would see you work mightily in our lives in ways that we never experienced before. Lord, and I thank you in advance for the work that you are doing right now in this moment and the work that you will continue to do. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.